My name is Susan Van Patten. I work with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation in the Division of Water. I want to thank everyone for making the trip and to be here this afternoon with us as we talk about um, this new grant that we have available. Um, the Land Acquisition Projects for Source Water Assessment. It's a new category for us in a long-standing grant program that we call the Water Quality Improvement Project Program, which some of you may or may not be familiar with the grant program. Um, <clears throat> the application period is open until July 28th of this year, and I want to make sure that people realize, you know, we have another couple of months to get applications in. Um, this funding is part of the Clean Water Infrastructure Act of 2017, the $2.5 billion that the governor has been talking about which means we have five years to spend the money. So this is year one, which you're going to see uh, in a few minutes. Lauren's going to give us the presentation. That's considered year one of the funding, but we anticipate having money over the next five years for these types of projects. So we hope that you're ready, that you can apply this year. That's our goal, is that we get lots of applications this year. Um, however, if you aren't, or if you have things that you think of after the application period is closed, well, continue working because we anticipate having money for similar projects in the next few years as well. So it's not a one and done, which is always a good thing. Um, today we're going to start the session with a brief presentation um, going over the criteria that is in the program overview. Um, if you did not bring a program overview with you, if you could just raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you a copy. Sorry. <laughs> Catherine's on the way to shut the door, and I uh, okay. put her there. So. Also, we are recording the session, and we will uh, put it on the WQIP webpage on the DEC website. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, if you have colleagues that weren't able to make it, or if you want to listen again to what we said, um, you can go there. We'll get it up as soon as we physically can, so that way people have um, time to look at it. Um, that being said, because it is recorded, um, there's a couple of like different things than we normally do in a you know, public meeting. Um, one is um, anytime we get a question in, we're going to have to re repeat it so that way this microphone up here gathers it. So just bear with us as we repeat questions. Um, but then also when we need you to ask you ask us all the questions during the session um, so we can record all the questions and make them available to everybody. Um, there's no dumb questions. Ask us anything that you want during the session, um, but please don't come up to us afterwards and, and have that one-on-one -on -one side conversation that we normally have at a public meeting that usually is really helpful, but we really can't have it in this setting for the grant um, today. We need to get all the questions in as an audience and get them recorded and, and whatnot. So um, the other thing about the questions is, you know, this is the first time we've done this category and we've talked a lot about it and the what if scenario, could you do this, could you do that, is this eligible, is this not eligible. However, I'm sure that we'll get questions that will stop us, we'll be like, huh, I never thought of that one. It's a good question. And just, you have to bear with us. Um, we'll write those questions down, we'll um, do a little research, we'll figure out an answer, and we'll post it as part of our FAQs. Um, that will be on the web as well. So. Um, we'll try to answer everything today, but we prefer, if we really don't know, then we don't want to give misinformation, so um, we'll defer and, and, and just come back. Um, I think that's about it. My last thing I want to do is I want to introduce the DEC staff that are working on this, and then I'm going to turn it over to start the presentation. So um, my name is Sue Van Patten, um, Division of Water, and I oversee the WQIP program. And so I'll start with Catherine and work this way. Okay. I'm Catherine Trena. I work for the DC Division of Water, um, and I am the Water Quality Improvement Project Program in general. My name is Lauren Townley. I am also with the Division of Water here at DC. Um, I work in a couple different programs, but have been involved in this land acquisition program recently. And I'm Jackie Lender, and I'm also with the Division of Water. Um, Lauren and I both work in the Mount Sanford section, so um, anything buffers um, or technical side of, of things, I'll have that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to give us the presentation. <laughs> All right, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Okay. So let's just get started. I'm going to give an overview of some things that are um, in the RFA and try to point to actual page numbers in the RFA so you can refer back to it. 
and then give a little bit more detail that we hope will be, will be helpful, and then we'll take questions at the end. So as you mentioned, the Clean Water Infrastructure Act was passed by the legislature this year, and that established some language in the Environmental Conservation Law that authorizes DEC to provide state funding for land acquisition projects specifically to protect drinking water. So this is completely new for us. Um, if you're interested in viewing the actual language that is in the law, it's under Article 15, Title 33. There's a link on this slide, and it's a little bit hard to navigate to, but it will bring you to the New York State Legislature page. There's a Laws of New York tab at the top, and then you can navigate to the Environmental Conservation Law. So the law that was established has set the basis for what we have in the RFA. So in terms of the eligible applicants, it's applicants that have the legal authority to acquire um, interest in real property, which includes uh, municipalities, oil and water conservation districts, and not-for-profit land trusts. So for the, the land trust, if you are not familiar with or haven't applied for state funding recently, you must be pre-qualified in the New York State Grants Gateway in order to submit an application. So this is a really important process that you have to go through. And it does take some, some time to complete the process, so we're encouraging people to start now. And even if you don't end up submitting an application, it's good for three years, so you would be set up to submit an application in future rounds. It's a multi-step process. You first have to get access to the online system, and then once you do have access, you have to answer some questions about your organization and upload um, documentation that's required you will receive a notification that your pre-qualification has been accepted, um, but until you receive that notification, you will not be able to submit, submit your application. So it's just really important to go through that process. There's a link here to the Grants Gateway page that, will, that has a step-by-step -step guide of how to complete the process. I'll just interrupt for a second. Just so folks can see you all family, this presentation with all of the links will be available after this meeting, so don't feel like you have to write all those down real quick post all of that on the W2IQ webpage as well. If you're in the Grants Gateway for another program, that covers this as well? Yep. Oh, sorry. So if you're already pre-qualified because you are already in the system, um, as long as it was in the last three years and it's still active, then you're fine. You don't have to pre-qualify again. Does that include the, uh, the Conservation Partnership Program? Is that, is that the same gateway or different? So the... So the question was whether or not that's the same gateway that is used for the, I'm sorry, which the Conservation Partnership Program. So that is a different system. So that's outside of the New York State Grants Gateway. That's a good question. Oh, so the question was whether or not you can check to see if you're still valid. You should be able to log into the system if you aren't able to see if you are, you should contact the Grants Gateway. Um, they have contact information on their website, and they would be able to let you know if you're still pre-qualified. All right. So we'll move on. Um, and just to let you know, even though your application is through the Consolidated Funding Application or the CFA, all of the contracting for this grant will go through the Grants Gateway as well. All right. So um, getting into the eligible program, so Unlike other categories of W2IP where they're project specific, we are actually looking to fund programs. So that's a little bit different. Um, in terms of identifying projects, you do not have to have specific parcels or projects identified prior to an application. You can give us an estimate of the number of acres that you hope to protect um, and a process of how you go about doing that. Uh, but the specific parcels do not have to be in your pipeline before your application. The reason that we're doing that is that we want to fund every step of the acquisition process from the, the solicitation through the transactional pieces of it and then the final um, acquisition. So, and then it's easier for us to allocate our money more quickly since we have a lot available. Um, we don't have to wait for specific projects to come in. So it's just a little bit easier for us to spend our money and set you up so that you're able to do this work. So does anybody have any questions about 
we'll get to that more later, but just want to make sure that program versus project is, is, is understood. All right. Right, so if you have, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so the question was, in the RFA, we do mention letters from landowners. Um, if you have identified parcels or um, received um, interest from landowners and, uh, prior to your application, you can include that in your application, and we would include that in the scoring for your project readiness or program readiness. So it's not a requirement. If you have done that work, though, just let us know, because that will influence your scoring. So we give you credit for that. What about how much, how much money is available that you don't, you're anticipating for, for this land, but you don't have it identified yet? What's the limit? How far limit? So we haven't, oh, I'm sorry. So the question was whether or not we have an upper limit for an application in terms of the amount of funding that can be requested. And we haven't set an upper limit right now. Um, we do have to attempt to distribute it equally throughout the state. So that will influence on, um, we're not really looking to fund only one applicant, let's just put it that way. So um, so we wouldn't want be looking for an application at the upper limit of what's available. And the available cost is $11 million for this year. Mind of, from what you said though about these events, what about the geography of the individual organizations? So I have to represent 26 counties mm -hmm. of the state, so I suppose the land trust might be in one or two. So Does that be looked at differently? So the question was if, if an organization represents a, a broad um, geographic area across the state versus a, a, a more defined, um, again, if you, if you look in the scoring matrix, it's, um, we are looking to distribute the funding across the state, but whether that be um, one organization that can hit every county or multiple organizations that work in multiple counties, that's not, uh, you know, that's not um, specifically laid out in the RFP. Um, that that's, you know, we would look at those applications and put them in. So the, the three different programs that we're looking to fund include protection of surface water, drinking water supplies, protection of groundwater supplies, and then in water body practices to control nutrients that are impacting surface water drinking systems. So those are the three. Um, in terms of uh, the surface drinking water supplies, we're also requiring it to be paired with restoration of riparian buffers or wetlands. Um, you both as well. If, if a buffer or a wetland does not already exist on the property. And then for the, the in-water body practices, we're also looking to have a land acquisition component. So you'd be completing practices in the water body and then also having a land acquisition program. Um, as Jackie mentioned, we're looking for a whole state, so all watersheds are eligible, including the New York City watershed. That was a question that we had gotten previously. So, and then you can also, if you're looking to do multiple program types, you're more than welcome to do that in a single application or in multiple applications, depending on how you'd like to do it. So in terms of the, the priorities, um, they're, they're listed on page 22 of the RFA, and then the scoring rubric is on page 44 of the RFA. So for priorities, we are prioritizing based on the proximity to the drinking water source. So for surface water, we're really looking for protection and restoration of those buffers and wetlands directly adjacent to the water body. And then for groundwater, we're looking for properties that are within the inner well zone, which is defined by the source water assessment program plan. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. And then if a, a source water assessment plan does not exist, because they don't exist for all surface or drinking water, or uh, groundwater supplies, um, we're looking for as close as possible within a thousand feet of the source. So if you have a water by public drinking water supply, is that one of the major tributaries or tributaries also, or just the main body of water? So the question was, if uh, a water body has major tributaries, are those eligible as well? So I will get to that in just a second. <laughs> Does this include private water supplies as well, or just public? So the question was, is this, is this um, eligible for private water supplies or 
not. And the question is, it's only available for public water supplies. Thank you for clarification. So the priority talks about the swap or within a thousand feet. So if the swap exists mm -hmm. and the priorities are established, then the thousand feet within the core doesn't apply if you have that have that in the city plan. Right. So the question was whether or not if the swap exists, uh, whether the thousand feet also applies and that. So it's what's defined actually in the swap as the inner well zone. So that will vary depending on the, the water body um, or the wellhead. So um, the thousand feet is only if the swap does not exist. So for those not um, not familiar with the, the source water assessment program as a program that's administered by the Department of Health and uh, through this program they've prepared reports for public drinking water supplies that delineate a source water assessment area and then they do have they have identified an inventory of contaminant sources and the likelihood that those contaminant sources would impact the water supply. Um, so in, in those reports, they identify uh, for groundwater, they identify an inner and an outer well zone that they've um, completed that inventory for. And um, there's not reports available for every um, drinking water supply, as I mentioned. Um, and unfortunately, they're not available online, so you will have to contact your local health department in order to get those reports. If you are unable to get them from the local health department, just let us know and we'll, we'll make sure that they're available to you. So for your local health department, there's a link on the site that will um, guide you to the contact information. And then there's some information on their website about the program for both Upstate and Long Island on the slide. Other priorities include parcels or watersheds that have been specifically identified in the New York State Open Space Plan. Um, so they're pretty specific. Starting on uh, page 80 of the plan, um, there are regional priority conservation project areas, and not all of them are related to drinking water, but the ones that have specifically been identified for drinking water are a priority for funding. And then in terms of the practices to um, reduce nutrients for, from internal loading. Um, we're really targeting water bodies that have been having issues with disinfection byproducts. Um, disinfection byproducts are caused by the interaction between uh, disinfection chemicals, usually chlorine, and um, organic matter that's present in the leaf or, or water body, which includes algae, plants, leaf litter. So it has to be a documented issue that the the source water has been having um, in order to be eligible for that. But that's definitely a priority as well. So the in terms of the secondary priorities, we're getting into the tributaries. So the secondary priority would be uh, tributaries that just directly drain into a surface water body. And we said within a 2,000 feet, because sometimes it's difficult to, term, to determine exactly where the drainage is occurring. Um, but those tributaries that directly drain, in, um, drain into the surface water body would be a secondary priority. And then going back to the swap reports um, for, for groundwater, uh, the outer well zone would be considered a priority. And then between, if, if no uh, swap report exists, between 1,000 and 2,000 feet of the wellhead would be a secondary priority. So just getting into repeating again, um, looking to fund programs, not just projects. And these are reimbursement grants. So um, we just wanted to point out that there's nothing that is forcing us to pay just fair market value for either the land acquisition or for an easement acquisition. So if there's a, a specific parcel that you would like to acquire, but you can't get it at fair market value, you can justify why you have to pay above um, we will take that into consideration and would be able to reimburse for that if it's justified. Sorry. Yep. Can you, can you go back to slide? Sure. When you say looking to fund programs, so one proposal can include multiple, multiple properties if it's the use of one watershed or one spot and then identify it as a priority of it? 
So the question, sorry, I missed the, the second part of it. Okay, so the question was whether you can bundle multiple areas in an application, and there's nothing that could stop you from that. So um, if you'd like to include different water sets, that's, that's completely fine. So unfortunately, so did you state the question? Already? Okay, sorry. So unfortunately, this is a straight reimbursement grant. So you have to pay out whatever the money is that you're going to ask us to reimburse you for. And you have to show full documentation. So, and it does take time, but um, if you put a really good package in, you know, you follow all the requirements for your documentation, we can turn it around fairly quickly. So I'm sorry, it isn't uh, cost incurred because that's more like um, what somebody is asking for the audio something who was saying, but you have to pay it out, show us the documentation, then we'll turn around and pay and pay you folks. And but as Jackie said, you can put an invoice in every month if you want. That's fine. It doesn't have to be you wait to the end. And I I'm sorry, see I'm a facilitator this meeting too, so I really want to start cutting off questions because I'm concerned that Lauren won't get through her presentation. So if people can just start jotting their questions down and really only hold a question if you truly don't understand what's on the slide because we just have to make sure that Lauren at least gets all the way through her presentation, okay? So I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut it at this point and give her the side if she takes more questions. Can I just ask for some clarification? Because if you said monthly, so while you might not be reimbursed for the CX or the easement acquisition, but you could be reimbursed for the survey cost, the appraisal, all of that. So the, the question was, you might not, so if you said monthly, the, yeah, the, um, can you apply, you know, you may not have the, the closing yet and have the full easement cost, and could you apply for survey cost and that sort of thing? Yes, you can, for those incremental costs, as they're paid out, you can turn around and submit a voucher request to be paid out for those things. I think that's important uh, and mm -hmm. to clarify before that those, um, again, that's why this is a funding program because you might complete five surveys on the next five parcels that you're going to buy. We can reimburse you for all five of those, um, you know, surveys as, as you move through that process. Um, so you don't have to just do one and then do the next one. You can, you can try to bundle these things together. And that's what we're trying to do with this. It's different yeah. than other programs that you're more familiar with to give you more flexibility to, to be, uh, think again, programmatically throughout your geographic area. What are you trying to get done and how, how to make that work? So that's what we're trying to do here. <laughs> your one, so. 
right. So I'll try to get through the rest of my slides. I'll get to the good stuff. All right. So um, in terms of land trust working to protect municipal water supplies, um, the municipality has to really be involved in the process along the way. Um, this is the actual um, law language re regarding that communication. So I just wanted to put it out there because it's very specific in that uh, a not-for-profit has to notify a municipality about their intent to acquire properties. And the uh, municipality has a 90-day window to object to those. Uh, properties. So just putting that out there that you, you definitely have to involve your municipality in this process. So getting back to requirements in terms of when you're submitting your application, you do have to provide protocols for your stewardship, your monitoring, and your enforcement. Um, that is required with your application. Um, and then in terms of the easements, they're all required in perpetuity. And um, in general, we're not setting specific uh, language requirements. We don't have a template developed for the actual easements. Um, but we are looking to see that any type of restoration that's done in terms of the, the buffers or the wetlands or existing buffers or wetlands, that they are protected and that there is language in your easement um, describing that. So that will be something that we will be looking for. In terms of the actual restoration requirements for buffers, um, we are requiring that only native trees, grasses, other types of plants are used. If there are existing invasive species, they should be removed and replaced with native species. Um, all of these uh, restoration requirements are eligible in terms of um, reimbursement. In addition, stream banks must be stable before you establish a buffer. Um, in terms of if you're not really sure if restoration is required for your stream bank, definitely um, encouraging people to reach out to the soil water conservation districts. They're a great resource. They could take a look at the site and let you know what type of restoration is required. We're also encouraging instead of um, really hard riprap shorelines that we would, we'd prefer to see some softer shoreline um, techniques. So, this has a link to our page on our DEC website that goes through some of those techniques. Also, in terms of um, the riparian buffers, we're looking for a minimum average width of 300 feet directly adjacent to a surface water body, and then for tributaries, 100 um, feet, minimum average width. So. What we mean by a minimum average width is that buffers are not these neat little triangles or squares or rectangles. So um, in some areas, they're, they're more narrow than others and then wider in other areas. So overall, we're looking for that, that average width. And then for the first three to five years, um, maintenance and monitoring of those new buffers is really important to make sure that the um, plantings that have been um, put in are, are established and functioning as a filter. So we would be looking for a maintenance plan um, on how you would be ensuring that those plants are successful. For wetlands, um, we're really looking for um, a description in your application or after the fact um, of how the uh, restoration of the wetlands will re really improve the wetland function or um, help to better protect the surface water body. And then in addition, similar to the buffers, we do require a maintenance plan for three years. For the in-lake, uh, in-water body practices to control nutrients, um, we're, we would be looking for a plan that has addressed any external nutrient sources and looking to see that that's underway and being implemented. So we're trying to limit the amount of nutrients before we start to address what's going on internally in the water body. And then we would also be looking for a qualified professional to determine what type of practice is appropriate for that water body and justify that there is actually internal loading and that the practice would address that loading. And then for some of the practices like um, hypolimnic aeration or dredging, um, we would like to see a long-term uh, operation and maintenance plan for those practices. So getting into the eligible costs, so it could be 
uh, personal services, staff time, uh, fringe that's associated with the staff that's working on the project, and then non-personal services, which includes contractual, travel, um, and other things like that. The acquisition piece of it, so the, either the direct property purchase or the purchase of those development rights for an easement. All the transactional costs associated with either of those acquisitions, so the baseline documentation, surveys, legal fees, all that sort of thing, are all included as eligible costs. And then restoration for either the buffers um, or the wetlands, and then also including the stream bank restoration as well. So things are ineligible. Um, so if your program doesn't include land acquisition, we, we can't help you because <laughs> it's a land acquisition program. And that includes the in-water body practices as well. Um, similar to other categories in WQIP, we cap the planning costs at 20% of your total award. Um, something really important that I want to mention is that wetland mitigation projects are not eligible. So wetland mitigation is where you build a new wetland because you're um, replacing or mitigating the impacts to a wetland because of a development project, and that is not eligible. Um, stream bank restoration costs are capped at 25% of your total award. And then indirect costs and any costs outside of your contract period. So if you've done work ahead of time, that's not reimbursable until you have a signed contract. And the match, you've been getting a lot of questions about match, so 25% local match is required. And in terms of eligible um, expenses that can be used as match, so anything that you would actually apply for funding is eligible as match. So the so development rate um, acquisition or your transactional costs or any of that sort of thing that you might have done up front that could be used as match. Um, if you have development rates that are donated by landowners, that's eligible. If you have actual properties that are donated, that would be eligible. And then if you are um, going through bargain sales or part of the purchase has been donated, that would be eligible as match. So really important uh, piece of it is that other state grant funding cannot be used as match. So it has to be local match that is used. So we'll take some more questions here. But if you have questions after the fact, um, we're accepting them through July 10th, so that's the deadline. You can email them to user.water at dec.ny.gov. And all the questions that we get today, questions that we've gotten previously um, to, from today, and then after today, will be all written up in an FAQ and posted on our website. And we'll try to update that as often as we can. There might be a little bit of delay, <laughs> depending on who's able to, to get the answers together. Um, but we'll try to get the answers up there so we're not holding up anybody's application. So, so just by way of how to do this, um, if you ask a question, I'll restate them so that Lauren can take that question. Thanks. Um, some municipalities use the Hudson River as a drinking water source. Um, so for tributaries that feed the Hudson in that municipality, um, those would be eligible parcels. So the question was, um, several municipalities use the Hudson River as a drinking water source. Um, within that, those municipalities, um, those uh, lands along the river are eligible. Is the whole Hudson River eligible? Okay, so if you look at, I need a question as well. Um, so in answer to that, on page 44 um, is our um, scoring rubric. So for instance, the maximum point um, using the Hudson River as an example, um, so a, a, a program or project that um, protects land um, to restore riparian buffers or whatever, uh, directly adjacent um, to the surface water body. So if you're drawing directly out of the Hudson, um, you would be looking for directly adjacent to that surface water body. Um, now going into the and that would get 30 points. The 20 point column, the next top column to your right, um, adjacent to tributaries that directly drain within 2,000 feet into a surface water body would get 20 points, and that, um, that protect land or create um, tributaries within a watershed um, would get the, the third amount of points there. So 
the question of the whole Hudson River Trust, you are looking to purchase um, a piece of land in the upper Hudson to protect the drinking water of downstate intake, blah, blah, blah. You have to make the justification why you thought that that was protecting that water supply. Um, so for instance, um, and, and uh, vicinity actually would have a greater impact, right? So the scoring would be looking at, you're looking at throughout the upper Hudson, um, but with municipal agreements that somebody downstate thought that that was helping their water supply, you would look at that and think that makes sense. Obviously things that are um, in a closer vicinity would have a this direct, um, direct orientation to the water body. So you have to guess that don't support yourself in those pretzels try to justify something that. Well, you wouldn't, so everybody gets ranked. So you wouldn't necessarily rank as high as somebody who was purchasing a piece of land on the Hudson directly adjacent to a drinking water intake. But you can make that case, but everybody gets ranked. Um, it's a two part question. Because one at a time. Okay. <laughs> when it comes to notifying municipalities, is that regard to easement and the acquisition, that's part one. Okay, let's answer that first. Okay. So when it, the question was, when it comes to notifying municipalities, is that pertain to easement as well as direct land acquisition? I'm going to go back to the slide because I, uh, it says any land acquisition project. So, and that's defined in the law as both. And in that, what if you have a parcel that is in one municipality that you're looking to purchase but protects drinking water in the adjoining municipality? Do you have to make both? One, the other? So the question is, what if you're buying a parcel of land <coughs> in um, municipality, one municipality that would provide protection to the drinking water supply of a second municipality? Um, do you have to provide notification? So the answer is you have to provide notification to the municipality impacted by the loss of the development rights or the ability to develop that land. So um, the intent is uh, whichever municipality is going to um, have a financial impact to this acquisition has the ability to do that. So the question was, what do I mean by financial impact? I mean a loss of the tax. Right. Okay. Yeah. Does that really work? the same line again. Um, so it's actually yeah. subject to program versus project. I'm hearing project, but if you have one landowner in the town that you contacted the town about, and a month later you have a second landowner, like two parcels away, do you need to get, um, okay. reach out to the town and each time you do a project? Okay, so the, the language about, so the question was, sorry, um, each time that you're doing a project, you have to reach out to the municipality. Um, and the, um, the, the language that speaks to um, that 90 days is for each project. So if, um, if you have five projects in one municipality, you can do that one um, as part of your overall program that you're, uh, you've been funded for. Um, or if you have, um, the only time you would have to reach out on, on one acquisition would be if that piece of land um, straddle two different municipalities, which certainly happens. Um, you do not have to, just to be clear, that this 90 days does not have to be done prior to uh, applying for this fund. This mm -hmm. is something that would be delineated out in your work plan. So if you apply for a program where you're going to um, get 10 parcels equaling X number of acres, um, then in that work plan and contract, once you've been awarded that funding, you're awarded the funding, we would delineate out how each of those parcels, um, the time frames for you to submit proof that you followed this 90 day um, notification in municipality. Does that make sense? Actually, if it doesn't, I'll explain it. Yeah, so here's the one distinction. It, it, so let's say you don't have your parcels identified yet. Could you go to the town and say, 
we're doing this program in town. We're looking to find five landowners to address the deep to five lane acquisition. Right. So we need to identify landowner A, landowner B, landowner C, and go to the town and start to So the